Father, we thank you for this Congress. Thank you for the revelations you have given us. Thank you for all our leaders. Thank you for all your servants that served us. Openly, publicly, privately, behind the screen. Those who served, Lord, we pray as they have blessed our lives, you bless their lives and ministries in Jesus' name. And we pray as you strengthen us, energize us, and we're rising with confidence. All your people, those who are able to congregate with us here, and those who by the pressure of duty at the Congress, they're not able to show up here physically. We pray the virtue from heaven will flow into every life in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, the great things you have done in sending your word in every message of all the ministers and all the studies we've had in the epistle to the Romans. Lord, we pray your power will not diminish in any life. Send your people forth with great anointing, with great power, with great confidence, knowing as we rise and we move on and march on, even the devil knows that we have conquered. Confirm your blessing upon everyone. Lord, keep us awake once again as we come to the concluding study in the epistle to the Romans. Bless your people abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray. We come to chapters 15 and 16 of the epistle of Paul to the Romans. And we're looking at the subject the exemplary model of compelling servanthood. As we look at these chapters, this is what we learn. We're saved to serve. We're born to reproduce. We're called to salvation and then commissioned to service following christ leads to fruitfulness fellowship with christ demands faithfulness and as we look at the concluding message of this epistle this is what we find three points in the message number one the perceived expressed meekness in Christ-like service. He calls us to a service. And he shows us a model. A perfect example. The model of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came and he served in meekness. And then as we look at this chapter 15. He's saying the meekness is not only resting with Christ. It abides with us. The perceived, expressed meekness in Christ-like service. Point number two. The productive, essential marks of courageous servanthood. The productive, essential marks. As we look at chapter 16 of the epistle of Paul to the Romans. We see individuals mentioned, fellow workers mentioned, fellow laborers mentioned, fellow prisoners mentioned, and the people that participated in the publication, in the proclamation, in the preaching of the gospel. And we see the essential marks in them that made them to be productive. And thank God, those marks are available to everyone. We shall be productive in Jesus' name. Point you then, the productive, 
essential marks of courageous servanthood. Point number three. In point number three, we're going to look at the whole epistle now as we conclude. Point number three, the perpetual enduring message in comprehensive summary. The perpetual, the message, message of the gospel, message of salvation, message of redemption, message of the righteousness of God, message of readiness for glory. As we look at the epistle itself, the sweep of the epistle, the perpetual enduring message in comprehensive summary. Point number one. The perceived expressed meekness in Christ-like service. Welcome to chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 verses 1 to 7 Christ's meekness and gentleness. Verses 1 to 7 Christ's meekness and gentleness. Verses 8 to 16, Christ's messiahship for the Gentiles. Christ, not only the savior of the Jews, not only the messiah for the Jews, not only the redeemer for the Jews, but purposefully, practically, positively, the messiah for the Gentiles too. Christ's messiahship for the Gentiles. Verses 17 to 33. Christ's messenger in his generation. The messenger of Christ that has given us a model in his own generation. That as we come and we rise up in the strength of the Lord. In our own generation, we have a model, a master, a mentor that we can say, This, the apostle to the Gentiles, look at how he did it, and look at how we too can successfully do it. You'll do it. We're looking at Romans chapter 1, chapter 15, rather, from verse 1 Christ's meekness. And gentleness we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmity of the weak and not to please ourselves but to let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification for even Christ please not himself but as it at his written the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were it in aforetime, were it in for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like minded one toward another according to christ jesus that she may with one mind and one mouth glorify god even the father of our lord jesus christ wherefore receive ye one another as christ meekness of christ as christ the gentleness of christ as Christ also received us to the glory of God. As we look at this section, it talks about the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the gentleness of Christ, the meekness of Christ. And it calls us saved, sanctified, sustained, separated believers separated from the world he calls us and he calls us to the meekness of christ 
Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11, reading from verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Meekness is an important virtue, an important quality that Christ as mighty, as powerful, as supernatural, as eternal, as he is, he manifested that when he was here and he said, learn of me. Numbers chapter 12, reading from verse 3. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Moses anointed, appointed, mighty, powerful, with the signs of a great man of God. Many miracles, yet the meekness that surrounded and supported his life and ministry. The Lord appreciated that, is passing that to us, the meekness and the gentleness of the Lord. Psalm 25, verse 9. Psalm 25, verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way as we have the anointing upon us. Sense the anointing upon us. And maintain the anointing upon our lives. We need to remain meek and gentle in ministry. So that that anointing will be sustained, flowing freely as we minister. Galatians chapter 6. Verses 1 and 2, brethren. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye that are spiritual, restore such and one in the spirit of meekness. As we counsel, as we preach, as we declare the word of the Lord to the people we're ministering to, restoring the backsliding, Rescuing the perishing, reviving the believers, re-energizing, invigorating the children of God. We do everything in ministry with meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Forbearing one another. And forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel, a disagreement, a misunderstanding, a misrepresentation, a conflict against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. As it brings us to the meekness of Christ, it assures us of Christ's messiahship for the Gentiles. We're coming to Romans chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 8 to verse 16. Christ's messiahship for the Gentiles. Now, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Yes, he came to his own. 
he was light to them although they rejected yet he came to minister to them but now for the gentiles verse 9 and that the gentiles might glorify god for his mercy as it is written for this cause i will confess to thee among the gentiles and sing unto thy name again he says rejoice ye gentiles with his people again praise the lord all ye gentiles lord praise him all ye people again isaiah says there shall be a root of jesse and he that shall rise to reign over the gentiles in him shall the gentiles trust and so we see that the atonement of christ the reconciliation that christ brought the redemption that christ as messiah purchased on the cross of calvary not only for the jews also for the gentiles and i myself in verse 14 also am persuaded of you my brethren that you also are full of goodness filled with all knowledge able also to admonish one another nevertheless brethren i've written them more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of god that i should be the minister of jesus christ to the gentiles ministering the gospel of god because christ died for the gentiles too he paid the price for the gentiles too and he's bringing the gentiles to salvation too that the offering up of the gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the holy ghost it tells us then a christ is also the messiah of the gentiles matthew chapter 12 in matthew chapter 12 reading from verse 17 matthew chapter 12 verse 17 in verse 17 look at what it says that it may be fulfilled which was spoken by Zias the prophet saying behold my servant whom i have chosen my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased i will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the gentiles he shall not strive nor cry neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets a bruised reed shall he not break the smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory verse 21 and in his name in the name of jesus in his name in the name of the only savior for humanity and in his name in the name of our redeemer in the name of christ shall the gentiles trust very clear then that salvation is of the lord for the gentiles it's not an afterthought the lord has spoken about that even long ago luke chapter 2 in luke chapter 2 reading from verse 30 luke chapter 2 verse 30 for mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the gentiles and the glory of thy people israel we're coming back to romans chapter 15 from verse 17 now christ's messenger in his generation paul the apostle and he shows us the way so that you too can be the messenger of christ 
in your generation. Romans chapter 15, verse 17. I have therefore, I have therefore, whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me to make the Gentiles, Gentiles, obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and on the bout unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should be, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. Through him, Paul the Apostle, those gentle people they saw. Through you. Are you still there? I said, through you. I said, through you, all those people, local government, region, state, nation, anywhere, everywhere, they will hear the saving gospel of the Lord in Jesus' name. To whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand, for which cause also I have been much in that coming to you. But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whensoever I take my journey into pain, Spain, I will come to you. You see Paul the Apostle, a model. See Paul the Apostle, our mentor. You see, Paul the Apostle, the messenger of Christ to us, the Gentiles, he went about. He took the journey. He took the gospel everywhere. Everywhere in the known world at that time. Traveled by land. Traveled by sea. Traveled on foot. And traveled by sheep. And he did everything. And the Lord is saying, he did that in his own generation. And now, this is your generation. You will do something. Something good you will do. You will save souls. And you are not just going to say it every time, every day in your local church. But you will go out of that local church. Yes, you are coming back to that local church. Coming back to that local church. But then, you are reaching out. Like Paul the Apostle reached out. And as he reached out, many lives were saved. You saved many lives. Many lives were rescued. You rescued many lives. Many lives were touched and transformed. You touch and transform many lives in Jesus' name. Verse 25. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it has pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are Jerusalem. It has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, the duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. For I am sure. Are you sure? For I am sure that I, that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness 
of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Say amen. amen. Every blessing you have got here, you will keep. Amen. The power that has come upon your life, you will keep. Amen. The vision that you have, you will keep. Amen. And the partnership that the Lord has called you to, partnership with the Holy Ghost, you'll keep that partnership, you will not leak away. The grace of God will not leak away in your life. The virtue of the Lord will not leak away in your life. And the power of the Holy Ghost will not leak away in your life in Jesus' name. So that as you get back, as you come to the people of God, those who are waiting, you've gone to renew your consecration commitment to the Lord in the ministry. And they are waiting. I am sure that when you get to them, you will get to them in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Another good militant, amen. amen. Now I beseech you, Vastachi, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the spirit that he is trying to gather with me in your prayers to God for me. We pray for our overseers. We pray for our pastors. We pray for all the leaders. You might even want to make a prayer list and remember them when you are closest to the throne. Remember that leader. Remember his wife. Remember the children. Remember the family. Remember the ministry in particular. Pray for one another. Pray for me that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. And that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints that I may come to you it's always reminding them i'm coming i'm coming and you're always reminding your people you're coming you're coming are you coming where are you there you get to those people and every challenge in their lives the lord will use you to bring solution in jesus name through you as you go to them the church will grow the church will be strong and the church will be mighty and powerful in Jesus' name. That I may come to you with joy by the will of God. And may with you be refreshed. Now, the God of peace be with you all. And the God of power be with you all. And the God of faithfulness. Be with you all. Amen. Going out, he'll be with you. Amen. Coming in, he'll be with you. Amen. Standing to minister, he'll be with you. Amen. Kneeling to pray, he'll be with you. Amen. Going forth to the evangelistic field, the God of peace and power and purpose and promise that God be with you all. Amen. Point number two, the productive essential marks of courageous servanthood. The productive essential marks. You see, it, there must be identifiable mark in your life. And you must not just be running on and rushing on. You, might, you will know what are the marks of the champion. One, two, three. Do I have them? Do I possess them? What are the marks of the achievers? The people who are successful in what the Lord has called them to. Do I possess the marks? What are the essential marks of courageous servants of God? As we look at all the servants of God, of course in chapter 16 of the epistle of Paul to the Romans, and then we look at those marks in the lives of other people that have gone before us. 
Do I have the marks? You'll have the marks. Whatever it takes to be successful, as we look at the word of God, you are going to possess them in Jesus' name. This chapter will divide to three parts. Number one, commendation for sacrificial service. Commendation for sacrificial service. Number two, caution against secret seducers. Caution against secret seducers. Number three, confirmation from supreme sovereignty. Confirmation from supreme sovereignty. We're coming to chapter 16, verse 1. Sacrificial service. Sacrificial servants. Selfless servants. The people that come to lay their talent, their lives, their knowledge, their gift, their ability, their strength, they lay it on the altar for the Lord, saying, I will serve the Lord. Commendation, the commendation of sacrificial service. Verse 1, I commend, commendation, I commend unto you, Phoebe, a sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at St. At Crea, starts with a sister. Verse 2, that you receive her, don't hinder her, that you receive her, don't stop her, that you receive her, don't discourage her, that you receive her in the Lord, as becoming saints, and that ye assist her in whatever business, business of the kingdom, she has need of you, for she has been a socorer of many and of myself also. Women who serve as leaders, women who serve as intercessors, women who serve as soul winners, women who serve as developing all the people like Priscilla, a woman, and Aquila, a man, husband, and wife, took Apollos and developed her and developed him. And he became more fervent, more knowledgeable in the things of the Lord. Verse 3 Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in the plural. In the plural, in the plural. If it were Aquila alone, he'll say, My helper. But now, both Priscilla, the wife, and Aquila, the husband, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Look at this. Who have, if it's only one person, it will be who has. But now, both of them sacrificial servants rendering sacrificial service who are for my life laid down their plural or next unto whom not only i give thanks but also all the churches of the gentiles likewise greet the church that is in their house they open their house for the preaching of the gospel, for the perfecting of the saints, for the propagation of the word of God. Salute my well-beloved Epanitus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us, not just labor, moderate. Not just labor single day. Not just labor temporarily. Much labor on us, Mary. You see, if we give allowance to everyone, everyone saved, everyone sanctified, everyone submissive to the Lord, 
everyone that is willing to do their part in the propagation of the gospel will run faster, will go farther, and by the grace of God, henceforth, every talent in the church will be used. Every available hand will be in the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. Salute for seven, Adronicus, and Junior, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners. See, there were people that were so courageous and they didn't mind that they would go to the prison, even as Paul was going to the prison. They said, if Paul the Apostle had the grace, if Silas had the grace to be in the prison and sing in the prison, why not me? And if the rest of us, if we have the grace to publish the gospel, if we have the grace to lift up the name of Christ in difficult, hard places, how about you? It says, they are of note among the apostles, who also are in Christ before me, verse 8, greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Verse 9, greet Uban, our helper in Christ, and Stachis, my beloved. And salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which have Aristobulus household. And it goes on and on, mentioning them because they were fellow laborers and they all gave what they had sacrificially. You will. I said, You will. Say, I will. Say that again, I will. Joyfully, cheerfully say, I will. God will help you. Every promise you make to the Lord, the Lord will grant you grace to fulfill. And every promise the Lord has made to you in his word, the Lord faithfully will fulfill in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, your labor will not be in vain. We go to the second part from verse 17. Caution against secret seducers. We're looking at chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren. Mark them, which cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine ye have learned, and avoid them. Secret seducers that will pull you away from the foundation of what the Lord had given unto you. Watch them, watch them, watch them. Avoid them. Verse 18, for they that are such, Serve not our Lord Jesus Christ and but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience, don't allow this to drop out of your life. Your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf. Are you there? I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. Are you there? I'm looking for him. I'm looking for her. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. We will always have joy over you. The leadership will always be grateful to God that you are there and that you are a helper. And that you are moving forward and pushing the gospel forward. And every time we see you, we'll be glad for you in Jesus' name. 
but yet i would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil don't allow those seducers to get you they will not catch you verse 20 and the god of peace shall bruise satan under your feet shortly looks like there's victory ahead of you looks like there is conquering ahead of you in jesus name and the god of peace the god of power shall bruise satan and evil spirits an evil situation an evil sickness and all the causes and all the calamities and all the things coming from satan they'll be under your feet shortly while you're sitting down stamp on them let me see you don't stand up just just sit down just sit down just sit down and stamp on those things that's how you'll stamp on every negative thing that comes against your life this year and henceforth in jesus name the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you caution against secret seducers number three confirmation from supreme sovereignty we're looking at verse 24 verses 21 to 23 is part of the commendation that he gave to different people you find timothy there luke there jason there so see Potter there, my kinsman, touch us there, gay us there, arrest us there, and acquit us a brother. Now verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of jesus christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret from since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting god make you make known to all nations for the obedience of faith to god only wise be glory through jesus christ forever amen, amen. confirmation consolation from the supreme sovereignty his power will go with you his glory will surround you his help will always be available unto you. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do in your life, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that walketh in us we need to make this one personal you carry power you carry anointing you carry authority and this power in you will never fail in jesus name make it personal instead of we i instead of us me now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that i ask or think according to the power that walketh in me unto him the glory in the church by christ jesus throughout all ages world 
without end. Amen. Now we come to point number three. The Lord has got us through the epistle to the Romans. And he has given us the message from this epistle to the Romans. And he has given us the message, first of all, for ourselves, for personal benefit. Number two, for ministerial benefit that we are to go into all the world and preach this message, comprehensive message, compelling message, the saving message of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're now going to give a perpetual, enduring message that will not die from your mouth. That will go on and on in your neighborhood, in your community, in your country, everywhere you go. This message from chapter 1 to chapter 16, everything in comprehensive summary, you'll preach with power and assurance in Jesus' name. Yeah. Chapter 1, the preaching of the gospel and faith. It says as we go, it's telling us what we preach. It's the preaching of the gospel and faith. Chapter 1, verse 14, all through to verse 17. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are from also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greeks. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The preaching of the gospel and faith. Chapter 2. The perception of guilt and failure. The perception of guilt and failure. Now we know. The natural man, Jew or Gentile, is guilty and is a failure without grace. Circumcision was nothing. Without salvation, all he has gathered, all he has collected in the religions of the world, they cannot save the soul. The perception of guilt and failure. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. You are condemned, you are guilty without Christ. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. Verse 24. In verse 24, it says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, chapter 3. In chapter 3, the propitiation and God's forbearance. The propitiation and God's forbearance. He wants us to go and tell the people as the Lord discovers them in guilt and failure. Now he wants us to tell them Christ has come. And it's the propitiation for our sins. And even though the gospel is coming to you at such a late hour, and you have sinned and sinned and sinned, there is the forbearance of God. Come now, come today. He will still receive you. Chapter 3 from verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins 
that are passed through the forbearance of God. Chapter 3, the propitiation and God's forbearance. Chapter 4, he wants us to take the whole gospel. And as we come to chapter 4, the promise granted through faith. The promise, promise of salvation granted through faith. The promise, promise of relationship with God granted through faith. The promise, the promise of full redemption. Promise given by God granted through faith. We're looking at chapter 4 verse 16. In chapter 4 verse 16, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that we also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 19, and be not weak in faith. He considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform the promise granted through faith number five uh, chapter five chapter five our peace and grace in fullness we're going to the world and we're telling them when god saves us he doesn't save us partially he saves us fully when god saves us he doesn't say just a part of us. He saves the entirety of the whole man. And we're telling them of the peace and the grace in fullness. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we're at peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith. Unto this grace, wherein we stand, rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense, death rage by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace, grace in its fullness, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life, by one Jesus Christ. Chapter 6. Our purity, godliness, and freedom. As we proceed, and we're showing the people of the provision of Calvary and the atonement of Jesus Christ, we're reminding them everything they need. From godliness to holiness to purity and to perfection and freedom. It's not by struggling. It's made available by Christ who died for us. Chapter 6, we're looking at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. And that henceforth, we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed, freed from sin. Thank God you are free. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22, but now be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We'll come to chapter 7. In chapter 7, the powerlessness of graceless foreigners. Foreigners who are not citizens of the kingdom. And they want to obey the law of the kingdom. Foreigners who have not got the grace that is made available in the kingdom. They are not kingdom citizens yet. And they struggle. They say, 
If he can do it, I can. No, he's doing it by grace. And if you have fallen into the grace of God, a foreigner to what Christ has provided on the cross of Calvary, there's the powerlessness of graceless foreigners. Chapter 7, verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not, foreigner. For what I would, that I do not, foreigner. But what I hate, that I do. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Come to Christ, he'll set you free. As you go, you're making the announcement, Christ has paid it all. Nobody needs to stand outside the kingdom, trying by himself, struggling by himself. You cannot achieve anything by struggling. The powerlessness of graceless foreigners. We'll come to chapter 9, chapter 8. Prevailing power with growing fortitude. Prevailing power with growing fortitude. Here is the believer saved by Christ indwelt by the spirit and because of that he has prevailing power and then as we come to the end of the chapter he has growing fortitude look at chapter 8 verse 1 there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in me, in you, in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We have prevailing power. Somebody there said, you have prevailing power. And we have growing fortitude. Fortitude, courage. Look at it. Verse 35. Romans chapter 8. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation answer now? Distress? Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Peril? Sword? Verse 37, nay. In all these things were more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death no life, no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no depth, no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Prevailing power with growing fortitude. Chapter 9. Perplexity over God's foreknowledge. Perplexity over God's foreknowledge. Those are under people like that, not only the Jews. And anything that happens, they'll say, is the hand of God. They'll say, is the will of God. The driver is drunk, and then there's an accident, and people die. It's God. They lose their families. It's God. A negative thing happens to somebody. They say it's God. They are perplexed. Perplexity over God's foreknowledge. Understand? Foreknowledge. Knowledge before it happens. That's foreknowledge. Take the case of Judas Iscariot. Jesus had the foreknowledge. That Judas Iscariot will betray him. Listen to this. But he did not make him do it. It was not the foreknowledge of Christ. 
that made Judas to do it. In fact, he warned him. And he said it were better that man were not born. But because he is perfect, that's why he had the knowledge. The foreknowledge does not make you to do anything. Just knows that you are going to do it. And you didn't repent. And so you perish. Perplexity over God's foreknowledge. Chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 11. In chapter 9 of Romans. Verse 11. For the children be not yet born. Neither having done any good or evil. That the purpose of God according to election might stand. Election in the sense that he was going to give the oracles to one nation, not two nations. That it might stand. It says, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. The nation that comes from the elder will serve the nation that comes from the elder. It says in verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. We've explained that already. You are no more perplexed, but those people, they had perplexity over God's foreknowledge. Chapter 10, the provocation of the gainsaying by the foolish. The provocation, the, the Jews were gainsaying. They were acting contrary to the call of God in their lives. And now the Lord said, I'm going to choose a foolish nation to provoke you to jealousy so that you will see the salvation that should have come to you is coming to them. And then you will rush into the kingdom through that provocation, the provocation of the gain saying with the, with the foolish. We're looking at chapter 10, verse 19 to verse 21. But I say, did not Israel know first? Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by that, by them that are no people, by a foolish nation, I will anger you. But Isaiah says very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Verse 21, but to Israel, he says, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Chapter 11, the people whom God foreknew. Chapter 11, a remnant that will repent, that will turn. That will seek the face of the Lord. Chapter 11, the people whom God foreknew. I'm reading from chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I say then, as God cast away his people, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. The people whom God foreknew. What not ye? What ye not? Know ye not? What the scripture says of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel. Look at verse 5. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, the people whom God foreknew. Chapter 12. The priority within God's flock. He has saved us by his very mercies. Mercy revealed in salvation, revealed in benefits, revealed in blessing us. And it says, because of the mercies, we now have a priority within the flock 
Look at chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A priority, look at verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another. That's a priority in God's flock. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Chapter 13. The purpose of governmental formation. The purpose that here we are. We're still living in the world. And because we're in the world, there are principalities and powers, there are officers, there are political leaders. And they rule over our communities, our local governments, our states, and our nations. What are we to do? We need to understand the purpose of governmental formation. is coming from God. And we need to give ourselves to the obedience of the laws of the land. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject to higher powers, to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The government is of its divine formation, institution. The powers that be ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Chapter 14. The preservation of gentleness in the fellowship. Chapter 14. The preservation. We're not beating down the weak. We're not driving by force the weak there must be gentleness in the fellowship and there must be that meekness in the fellowship the preservation of gentleness in the fellowship chapter 14 verse 1 him that is weak in the faith receive ye but not to doubtful disputations verse 16 in verse 16 let not your good be even spoken of. Don't argue with the people. And don't put pressure on the people. Maybe you have a good intention. Don't let, let not your good be even spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Chapter 15 The pursuit of greater fruitfulness. The pursuit of greater fruitfulness here is our model here is our mentor here is what here is a master so to say the apostle of the gentiles he has led a model for us a ministry for us an example for us and we need the pursuit for greater fruitfulness chapter 15 verse 19 through through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and out about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest 
I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. They will see in Jesus' name. And they that have not heard shall understand. Then he goes on to say, but, it, for, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And that they that have not heard shall understand. Verse 29. In verse 29, and I'm sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. He has left that example for us and you will follow after the pursuit of greater fruitfulness in Jesus' name. Chapter 16, partnership with godly fellow laborers. You're not going to be a lone ranger. Look at Paul the Apostle. That man that had gone to the third heavens to paradise and he came back and he heard things he couldn't even reveal to men down here yet he said i'm not alone i have a team around me i'm not alone i have fellow workers fellow laborers fellow prisoners around me partnership with godly fellow laborers chapter 16 verse 3 Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church in their house. We're going to walk together. We're going to run together. We're going to serve together. And this work will prosper in our hands together in Jesus' name. Let's unite in faith. Unite in love. Unite in consecration. Unite in commitment to the revelation of the gospel. And as you go, as you arise, and you go with the gospel, the power of God will go with you. The strength of the Lord will go with you. Even Satan will tremble before you in Jesus' name. Arise, don't be weak. Arise, don't look back. Arise and preach the gospel. Arise and tell the world a Savior has died. Church of the living God, arise and tell the Lord, I will, I will, I will. Arise and commit yourself afresh unto the Lord.